All right, people are getting quiet, so I'll, I'll introduce um, our speakers. So we have a really exciting speaker today. We have Professor Kathleen Forsky, a member of the archaeology faculty, a lecturer in archaeology, PhD in anthropology from the U in 2021, and a researcher of agricultural systems of the early Islamic world uh, in the Mediterranean. So she is known for um, some of her exciting recent publications on the Islamic, early Islamic period in Israel, um, including an article in Vegetation History and Archaeobotany, and another article in the Journal of Economic and Social History of the Orient, which is <laughs> understandably known just by an acronym, JESHO. Um, so look those up if you want to know more about her work in the Eastern Mediterranean. But today we're going to hear instead about exciting new work in the Western Mediterranean. And so thank you for joining us. Great. Well, thank you, Mac, for that introduction. I'm really excited to, you know, finally have enough data from this small research to be able to finally say something kind of conclusive. Um, just a little plug for myself also, um, I was able to get a, an ASOR fellowship last summer for field work participation and they just released a little um, kind of coverage of, uh, I guess a write-up that I did saying, you know, how did I use your money? So that's uh, available on the ASOR website now with more pictures and a little bit more about kind of um, the project overall, um, and if you guys are interested in reading that. but. Um, today I'm really going to be focusing on kind of these first looks at farming and food waste here in our beautiful little Mediterranean village. So um, with the nor'easter behind us, let's uh, kind of transport ourselves to the sunny Balearic Islands. So some of you may be familiar with the Menorca project and its storied history at EU. So this is essentially um, the brainchild of our very own Amalia Perez Huez, who is um, the director of the BU Madrid program and also an affiliated faculty in history and archaeology. Um, she basically turned this field school now into no longer a field school, but instead a dedicated research project where we bring on graduate students, uh, early career scholars, and collaborate with a lot of other um, specialists and archaeologists across Spain kind of at large. Um, and so it's also co-directed by um, Alex Smith, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at SUNY Blackport. Um, so between Amalia and Alex, we kind of are a, a small um, cadre of people who are really trying to take a look at what did it mean to live in this rural area during this um, early, or I guess, Islamic period. Um, because we are a small team, um, we're only about 12 in the field at any given time. Um, it's taken about two field seasons to really get kind of um, enough data to really start to investigate our questions and connect to broader themes of inquiry across Islamic Iberia. Um, so some of the themes that we're really investigating are memory and landscape use because uh, Menorca is kind of known for its megalithic Iron Age settlements. Um, so what we have is basically the, the traces of this prehistoric um, town that then got reoccupied a thousand plus years after it had been abandoned. So it brings up a lot of questions about memory and landscape, different themes that Katina Lilios had touched on um, during her brown bag last semester, if any of you attended that or are familiar with her work. Um, so as Matt kind of said too, um, this is my newest avenue of research. Um, I'm broadly really interested in understanding how people adopted agriculture and foodway systems to kind of changing environmental and socioeconomic conditions that tend to be attendant with um, diasporas and uh, like empire expansion. And so um, I happen to land in this medieval Islamic era, so I'm trying to eventually build up um, a comparison of agriculture and foodways in the Levant with Iberia and kind of do kind of a cross-Mediterranean comparison. So um, this is the first kind of step towards building up uh, that Western Mediterranean focus. So a brief history of a very long 700 plus year um, period in Al Andalus. Um, that's the Arabic name for the Iberian Peninsula, which includes modern day Portugal and Spain. Uh, it was first conquered by the Umayyad dynasty around 711 CE, um, and the uh, Umayyad expansion really spanned, you know, North Africa, Western Europe, all the way into 
the Middle East. Um, the Umayyads had their capital in Damascus in Syria. Um, so basically what that means is you know, eventually the far-flung uh, corners of the empire kind of divided off and became a little bit more um, self-governed. So what we see happen is uh, various caliphates get um, founded, centered around specific cities in Spain, um, and it was in about 902 that the Balearic Islands themselves um, were annexed into the Al-Andalus region. And so um, you can see the Balearics just off the, the coast of Spain here. Around the 10th and 13th century, the island population was pretty dispersed. Um, people were mostly engaged in animal and plant husbandry, lived a, a very peasant-based life. And there's only maybe one or two large urban centers in the Balearic Islands at this time, one of which was on um, the far western side of Menorca. Um, and basically what we end up across this landscape is a very rural swath dotted with uh, two types of uh, settlements. We have the Alcarias, which are essentially um, agricultural settlements, and then Rafals, which are collectively operated pastures that are associated with the settlement, so a little far from there. In 929, Abdel Rahman III founded the Caliphate of Cordoba, establishing an independent Umayyad state as appeared to be a Basid Caliphate whose uh, capital was in Baghdad. This Caliphate of Cordoba dissolved around 1031, and then Al-Andalus was broken up into a series of small taifa kingdoms or petty kingdoms. Um, and these were the ones that were centered around major cities like Seville and Saragossa. Between the 11th and 13th century then, there were a few North African dynasties that kind of brought um, Iberia and Al-Andalus under their purview. Um, and then around the uh, early 1300s and through the course of that century then, um, the Christian kingdoms um, that were kind of um, sequestered up into the northern part of Iberia um, began to basically force their way down south uh, expanding their territory through a process um, known as the Reconquista and started to push people back down into North Africa or back into the Balearic Islands. So ultimately, um, Catalan kingdoms conquered the Balearic Islands um, in kind of the late 13th century, um, and then ultimately the Islamic rule of Iberia ended in 1492 when the Emir of Granada um, named Muhammad XII surrendered to Christian forces of the Christian monarchs Isabel of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. So keeping this kind of political geography in mind too, um, there's a really interesting correlation between kind of the political boundaries and the environmental boundaries. So with regard to the agricultural systems in place during this period, there's a general north-south divide across the peninsula. The Tagus River, uh, here highlighted in blue, uh, is the general boundary between cooler, drier, cereal-focused agriculture in the north um, and more Mediterranean-type agriculture focused on irrigated olives and grapevines in the south. Basically, the agricultural system in the north uh, was a continuation or a more, a more similar continuation of the Roman agricultural economy, which was based on large-scale production, extensive extractive dry farming of cereals, uh, some olives and some grapes, but um, notably there wasn't the same amount of irrigation and kind of um, wet adapted agriculture that we find in the south and in the islands. The major crops were whole barleys and naked wheats that were dry farmed, and um, the surpluses of this agricultural economy in Christian Spain uh, basically flowed from rural centers into the more urban centers. So we basically see a uh, rural hinterland provisioning the urban centers um, that were controlled by lay or ecclesiastical lords, um, and basically you follow the church, you follow the, the gold, right? <laughs> or the golden grain. In contrast, though, um, Islamic Spain was more of an urban-based society that focused more on artisan production, and these are patterns that you also see played out in the Islamic Levant as well. Um, so what kind of goes along with um, the focus of um, artisan production around urban centers is arguably a concentration of agricultural production around the urban centers too, instead of in these big, wider uh, rural hinterland areas. 
the other kind of hallmarks of Andalusian agriculture, at least in the mainland, is um, irrigated arboriculture and diversification of plots. Um, over time, there's a huge influx in different types of fruits and um, vegetables that are um, brought about through kind of the Arab agricultural revolution, which is um, kind of a, a now dismantled theory that basically um, models the expansion of certain tropical crops following the expansion of Islam, kind of from um, the Middle East across, of course, to the Western Mediterranean here. Um, so while kind of the original theory of that hasn't really um, supported by the material on the ground, by the botanical evidence, what we do see over time, though, is an increase in the types of fruits um, compared from like kind of the Roman pre-Islamic period in Spain uh, through this medieval Islamic era. So essentially what we see is that during this medieval period, with the arrival of Arab and North African Muslim populations, that this agricultural economy of the peninsula writ large really underwent a shift bounded by both cultural and environmental lines. Um, even through kind of the 13th and 14th, 15th centuries, the Christian communities in the north continued the long-established European focus on cereal cultivation, while the Muslim communities in the south cultivated a variety of cereals and fruits, um, aligning again with that kind of agricultural diversification associated with the spread of Islam. So here we go, we get to picture ourselves in the sunny Mediterranean instead of, you know, post nor'easter Boston. Um, basically, the land use and settlement patterns across El Andalus were really influenced by those established in prehistoric times. Um, in the case of the Balearic Islands, the barrancos, or the valleys, like the one we see pictured here, um, were really important places of cultivation that were often made arable by terraces and irrigation systems. And so, in the center here, you can see um, the border of uh, an irrigation ditch here um, that's, you know, got beautiful kind of sedge type um, <coughs> plants growing along the side of it. Uh, it's watering um, these uh, orchards that are kind of at the, the bottom of these hills, um, a nice little farmhouse here. And what you can kind of make out as well through the overgrowth is a couple of lines of rock terraces here. Um, these are supposed to have been built during the medieval period and it's still in use today. So we have really interesting examples of kind of land reuse, uh, landscape legacies, and kind of um, investment style agriculture here as well. And so early researchers investigating Andalusian agriculture on Menorca have really focused on these really visible kind of built, um, in, uh, built components of the agricultural economy, um, in part because, you know, they're they continue to be used today. Um, and there's still a continuation of um, these garden, or market gardens rather, or huertas that people still cultivate um, all over the place. We're not really aware of any botanical research on agricultural systems being conducted on Menorca, or uh, there might be one or two botanical um, reports looking at agricultural economy on another Balearic island, the island of Mallorca, but uh, it's gray literature, it might be in Catalan, so there are a couple barriers to accessing it, but um, basically what we know so far about agriculture on the Balearic islands is based on this type of water wheel irrigation infrastructure. And so here's an example of a private home with a huerta that's still uh, cultivated today. This is outside the little town of Alayor. Um, and so uh, this is taken like, looking from a main road, road down to the house and you have a couple different types of fruit trees, um, some terraces that maybe are home to other smaller vegetable gardens and things like that. Um, but you know, we still see the, the landscape dotted with private places of cultivation and I think that provides a really interesting model of what this maybe had looked like also during the medieval period. And so there were various scales of cultivated plots recognized within the Islamic society. Um, there were distinctions made between kitchen gardens meant for personal consumption and larger scale gardens meant for surplus production for market sale. There was also distinction between irrigated and unirrigated gardens. Um, we see from land registers and various tax, doc tax documents that peasants grew cereals and fruit trees um, in plots next to their home in kitchen gardens. So um, there's a little bit of overlap maybe the types of um, types of fruits and vegetables that are grown for personal household consumption and then um, cultivated specifically then for market sale. But we see that that organization is different than um, in northern Spain, in the Christian communities, where it still was very much 
large-scale extensive cereal cultivation um, that then was more centralized instead of kind of a um, more of a farmer's market kind of economy like I think we have here. Really interestingly and importantly, we have a really rich historical corpus of agronomic texts. These exist in varying degrees of translation from their medieval Arabic. Um, some of these texts have been translated into Greek or Latin um, or medieval Spanish. Um, and increasingly, they're becoming more available online. Um, there's a really fantastic um, kind of agricultural text website called um, the Philaha Text Project um, that has a lot of these translations excerpted. Um, one of the most famous agricultural treatises for uh, Al-Andalus is called the Calendar of Cordoba, which was written uh, in 961. It reads partly like an almanac, partly like um, an agricultural treatise, right? Describing kind of the rhythm of the months, what happens each month. Um, it touches on not only what happens in the field, but kind of what happens in the household, uh, what happens with animals. And so, um, again, trying to transport us maybe to Menorca or Al-Andalus in March, um, according to the calendar of Cordoba, we see that in March, now the fruit trees are coming into leaf. Um, vegetable gardens are starting to produce some broad beans. Uh, you're planting cucumbers, planting cotton, safflower, and aubergine or eggplant. Um, and we also see that um, people are growing citronella and oregano, which is a type of oregano. So just from this short paragraph, we can see the different types of things that people were really engaged in um, producing and things that were important enough to record, right? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> It, you know, kind of in terms of methodology, historical documents like this are really interesting to then compare your botanical record to. Um, you know, if people are outlining the types of things people should be growing or could be growing, you can see if any of those exist in your, in your assemblages. Um, <laughs> these fantastic plants that are listed here uh, have eluded us so far in the botanical <laughs> record from Torben Gama. So um, that just, you know, means we need to keep sampling and keep floating and looking some more. Um, this calendar has been um, translated into various Latin and Arabic scripts. There's kind of a debate about, is this written by a Christian, is this written by a Muslim? Um, there's attention to both Muslim and Christian holidays in it. Um, and there's a big discussion also of bodily health and hygiene as well. In addition to these agricultural treatises, there's a rich historiography of culinary texts as well. Um, the most relevant one for our research in Menorca is um, this 13th century cookbook by a scholar named al Um So it was just translated and published uh, a couple years ago, um, and it's translated as the best of delectable foods and dishes from Al-Andalus and Al-Maghrib. So Al-Andalus being the Iberian Peninsula, and the Maghreb being basically North Africa. So it really provides an interesting kind of cross-regional comparison. Um, and the author, al Tujibi spent different periods of his life, both in Al-Andalus and the Maghreb. So he brought kind of his own personal ideas about what's the best version of recipes. And he, because he's familiar with different types of preparation of specific dishes, he'll provide you know four variations of a dish and kind of opine his, his way through it and say which one's the better, which one's you know, the preferred way for him. Um, but he also really specifies how to clean your dishes, how to clean your hands before you prepare the food. Um, he outlines what the best types of kitchen cookwares and utensils are. Um, and so he has a lot of opinions, but they're really great because you know it, they give good examples of what to expect um, to find in a kitchen assemblage. Um, you know, it's it's a nice a nice kind of test, right? Um, again, comparing the historical record to what we find in the archaeological record. So keeping kind of this um, broad historical and um, geographical backgrounds in mind, uh, let's focus in on our island of choice here. Uh, so Menorca is located off the coast of southeast Spain, um, like we saw in the earlier map. Um, it is the island just east of Majorca and a couple islands over from Ibiza. So people tend to confuse Majorca and Menorca, but everyone knows where Ibiza is. Um, <laughs> you know, coming after spring break. So. <laughs> Uh, Menorca, as you might surmise, is characterized by a typical Mediterranean climate with these nice, cool, wet winters and warm, dry summers. 
The limestone bedrock hosts a range of vegetation communities, um, the major ones of which are Mediterranean pine and oak forests, kind of more in the, the upland areas, um, olive and carob forests, and a lot of scrub, maquis, and kind of coastal dune communities uh, along the coast here. So specifically then, the site of Tordengalmez um, is located in kind of the southeastern portion of the island here. Um, it's a south-facing slope, and the site, um, as I said at the top of the lecture, is really known for its large taliotic structures. Um, it's up for, uh, or I guess undergoing review, to be included on the UNESCO World Heritage List right now, because um, there's a huge taliotic settlement here, um, one of the largest, if not the largest, on the islands in the Balearics, and so um, there's been a lot of attention paid to this kind of Iron Age, late Iron Age period, um, but it's, it's time to now also bring more awareness into these later medieval periods because they're intertwined. They're literally built on top of one another. Um, so what we see in um, kind of an aerial view overlooking the site, um, just rough kind of GIS mappings of some of the Islamic structures that we've identified over the last few seasons. Um, the data that I'll be talking about in this talk come from these two um, house compounds highlighted in blue here. Um, and the uh, red kind of outlines of these structures, um, there should be many more of these on this map because uh, we were doing a little bit of kind of informal pedestrian survey, you know, kind of just traipsing over you know, rubble of limestone. And um, as soon as you kind of understand the like spatial syntax that you're looking for to identify an Islamic house, uh, they start to pop out everywhere. So we're thinking that this is not just a couple of random houses tucked into these Iron Age ruins, but instead it's hopefully, possibly, a, a larger uh, Islamic Muslim village here. Um, we have some really nice radiocarbon dates associated with this Islamic occupation. Based on the ceramics and radiocarbon dates, we get a nice tight um, 13th century um, occupation date for this period. Um, in terms of like how many generations people have lived here, your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, how many generations does it take to build up, you know, a dozen or so houses in a certain way? Um, and so, we're thinking also that, you know, what else is happening in this in kind of the political landscape now? This is the heyday of the Reconquista. The North um, Christian communities are really starting to move south and pushing people off the mainland into the islands. So. Our question is, is this a population of refugees? Um, are people choosing to live in these um, abandoned ancient ruins because of population pressure? Um, what made them choose to live here? Um, so that's kind of another line of um, investigation that the, the research team is trying to answer, right? Like, how did people decide to settle here? Um, there's some really interesting parallels with um, village settlements that we see in the Levant, um, specifically like in Jordan and kind of more arid um, parts of, of that area and uh, what we have here at Menorca. Um, specifically, there's um, a, a proper Islamic village contains a watchtower, and so the idea is maybe they found these taliots, these big monumental structures, and thought, oh, well this looks like a perfect watchtower for our settlement. Um, so we're kind of trying to parse out those types of, of questions, and um, in order to do that, we're trying to get together, um, you know, start this conversation with other scholars, and again, bring this diachronic, or this uh, synchronic, but it regional perspective comparing the Eastern and the Western Mediterranean. So um, these are what those uh, taliotic structures look like. They are characterized by these T-shaped beams called taulas. Um, they're huge. They're these megalithic, beautiful structures. Um, they are maybe a meter and a half to two meters tall. Um, and so they are all circular as well. The large um, taliots, these towers, are um, thought to have been some sort of communication system, some sort of surveillance system, perhaps. Um, but they are dotted across the island. And um, when you stand at the top of them, you can see across the other one. So there's some sort of um, communication um, system that was built in this Taliotic era. So to really get a sense of how this ruined, abandoned Iron Age settlement works alongside the Islamic 
medieval settlement, um, we'll take a look at the aerial views. So highlighted in the yellow circles are some of these circular taliotic homes. Um, you know, limestone is famously or infamously difficult to kind of discern depth and structures, but um, what we can also see pretty clearly, at least here, is um, some of these square buildings, which are the Muslim houses built either over top the Taliotic structures or abutting against. Um, so what we certainly have is reuse of these abandoned structures. Uh, why would you go somewhere and quarry your own rock when you can just borrow from a house that no one's living in, right? Um, and so what we have is a series of these medieval houses um, built in between the spaces of these Taliotic homes or uh, abutting them right up against their walls and sharing walls in some, in some cases. So keeping in mind these facets of historical, environmental, and kind of legacy backgrounds, um, I'm going to really focus on two questions for the duration of the talk then. First is what aspects of farming practices and foodways can we reconstruct at Toward and Galmas? And secondly, how does this information compare to the mainland? In other words, are there differences between this rural island settlement and mainland rural ones? And so, um, as I had alluded, this data comes from primarily two house compounds that we've excavated. Um, we have uh, SPU 7, or House 7, which is less well preserved. Um, we see um, co-director Alex describing some of the, the wall features here in um, a public talk that we were giving to people visiting the site. Um, but what you can really see here is um, nice square walls, kind of the get an idea of the dimensions of this. It's not a very wide space. Um, and then what Alex is crouching on is um, that retaining wall from uh, the Taliotic house that this Muslim house has been built on top of. Um, Spoo 6, or House 6, uh, was very well preserved. Um, so a lot of the data that I'll be talking about, particularly the ceramics, will be coming from that along with the botanical remains. Um, Spoo 6 is this beautiful, kitchen area that um, we see um, from a drone photo and then also from a nice uh, plan drawing here. Um, and what we can do with SPU 6 that we can't do with SPU 7 is connect SPU 6 to the rest of the house compounds that it's a part of. Um, so if anyone is familiar with uh, kind of traditional Muslim houses, there's a specific syntax and a specific organization for how that these should be built. Um, there's uh, a few rooms that are constructed in an L shape um, that surround a small courtyard. The courtyard then is surrounded by some walls, um, and the entryway is always going to be um, in this corner or in an area rather where when you first walk in, you're not looking directly into the private residences of the home. Uh, you see um, this value of privacy, this value of private space. Um, and this is exactly the same type of structure that you see in you know, houses built uh, in the Middle East today. Um, this is definitely some sort of uh, cultural template that people have carried with them across different, um, different regions and different time periods. And so um, we were able to excavate this uh, lower room here, excavated out a little bit of the, the patio here to try and kind of figure out, you know, is there anything um, worth looking at, do we find any other sort of artifacts or signatures of use here? Uh, and part of our goals for this upcoming season will be to excavate these other two rooms. Um, what you can see on the plan here also is um, Spoon 9, which is another small kind of disconnected room uh, that is in line with um, kind of the bottom walls of this courtyard. And there's a cistern between um, these two rooms here. So we're starting to look at maybe a little bit of like neighborhood organization shared um, water space or shared storage space. Um, we're calling it a cistern, but it could have been used as some other sort of um, like uh, underground storage facility. Um, this area is dotted with caves and there's evidence that people had been storing wine and honey and other things in there. The only thing we found in this cistern was shells and a lot of stuff that had washed down uh, from the slope into it. <coughs> But uh, SPU 6 was beautifully preserved. We have a beautiful um, plaster floor um, that we basically um, exposed half of through kind of bifurcating um, the compacted 
fill that's immediately above it. Um, and so looking at the eastern wall here, um, we found a doorway that's currently being excavated in this photo. We found flat grinding stones or some sort of flagstone embedded next to the doorway, um, a, what we interpret to be a handheld grinding stone, a mono. Um, maybe some sort of little fireplace um, kind of cut into the plaster floor here that had um, really ashy um, dirt and burnt fragments of bone and a lot of friable wood charcoal. Um, and what we find with the plaster too is it went all the way up the walls as well. So um, think of like an immaculate like white kitchen, right? This is the type of thing that we were dealing with. Um, and so the uh, doorway uh, is right here and that would open out into the patio. And so um, what we're trying to figure out too is, you know, what are maybe some food preparation activities that would have been taking place or that would have taken place close to this door where there's maybe more light, more air circulation, things like that. Um, we have some really interesting thoughts about, you know, kind of next things to do. There was another combustion feature um, that was kind of pedestaled over here that just kind of looked like melted, um, like clay, how it gets kind of rubified. Um, and we're awaiting micromorphological analysis to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, so we'll be looking at the plant remains next, and these come from a combination of both SPU7 and SPU6. Um, overall, the assemblage is um, pretty sparse. There's not a whole lot, so it's more meaningful to look at the material in aggregate as opposed to uh, looking at the specific plant remains from the individual structures. Um, overall, there's only 16 and a half uh, whole economic seeds that have been identified, um, and all of the economic seeds identified um, weigh a measly 0.31 grams, which um, is very, very little, especially for two years worth of excavation. Um, it, uh, the density of charred remains is uh, 0.28 grams per liter, which as far as I can discern is pretty typical for this kind of Mediterranean region right now. Um, that's comprised mostly of wood charcoal. This assemblage is mostly very friable, difficult to identify wood charcoal. Um, but when we're focusing on the economic seeds, what we see though is that this assemblage is um, dominated by cereals. They make up 80% of that assemblage by weight, um, followed then by fruits and nuts and pulses, um, kind of in equal amounts. Looking at uh, the counts of the various uh, categories too, um, we see that there are about 29% cereals, very few pulses, very few fruits and nuts, and instead, this is where the wild seeds can really start to shine. We have a lot of carbonized wild seeds. Um, some of them are carbonized beyond the point of recognition. Um, I'm still trying to kind of figure out if maybe we can find at least a family of these, um, but um, more about the weeds in a little bit. So, trying to figure out how our data at, in Menorca compares to um, broader patterns across the uh, Iberian Peninsula, um, I was trying to compare this to data that was put together uh, in a synthetic article by um, Lenore Peña Chocaro and colleagues. Um, they published this article in 2019 in Quaternary International, and they were basically trying to trace crop patterns throughout the Roman period, late antiquity, and the medieval periods. They were also interested in kind of parsing out um, rural and urban differences um, across these different regions of Al Andalus. So basically, um, each little pie chart here corresponds to a different time period, so uh, Roman, antiquity, um, and then we have medieval Christian and medieval Islamic. And so each kind of cluster of um, pie charts here represents a different region that uh, they recognize. So two, four, six, two, four, six. So eight different regions. Um, Menorca just barely makes it onto their map, so that tells you a little bit about kind of the way that the Balearic Islands um, feature in people's ideas and studies of, of, uh, of Al-Andalus. Um, so basically what we have is, um, again, looking at the economic crops from uh, Tordengaunas, and it's dominated by cereals. Um, so looking at just broadly these general categories of economic seeds, then um, we only have three categories out of the five that are recognized in this article. Um, we don't have any fiber crops, we don't have any oil crops, um, 
we don't have anything um, that we really consider to be spices the same way that they found other things in other parts of Spain. Um, interestingly, the only identifiable pulse in this assemblage is maybe bitter vetch. Um, it's pretty poorly preserved. It's cut in half, or I guess, you know, fell apart in half. Um, but that, that, that's the 10% of the pulses. Uh, but basically, you know, what we have um, in terms of patterns, what we have at Menorca really resembles what we see here in the northeast, central, and northwest regions of the Iberian Peninsula. So um, the cereals here are represented by these kind of um, jail stripe sections of these pies. So um, you see kind of um, these pie charts getting dominated here. Looking at the different kinds of cereals, um, across the Iberian Peninsula, people have been able to identify barleys and wheats and oats and millets. Um, but lucky for us, we only have two types of cereals, and they are <laughs> barley and just indeterminate cereal. These things are very overly burned. Um, it's hard to say anything beyond the fact that they're <coughs> a grain at some point. Um, so again, comparing these patterns in Menorca to broader regions, uh, this preponderance of barley resembles more kind of the southern and eastern areas. So um, barley uh, is these other kind of jail stripes over here. And these are pretty well preserved barleys. Um, but this is basically all of them. So <laughs> just a small <laughs> cluster, right? So this is their great debut. But I mean, they're, they're beautifully preserved. They have beautiful ventral furrows. Um, you can see the embryo on many of them. Um, some of them might be slightly twisted. This curved ventral furrow makes me think maybe it is. Um, open to any, any ideas anybody else has. Um, but uh, this is basically what we got in terms of cereals. Fruits from Tordengalmez are very, very scant. Um, there's only one possible grapefruit and one fig seed and maybe a grape pedicel, which is a little stem that's attached to the individual grapefruits. Um, so we can't really make any meaningful comparisons right now. Um, although it's interesting to note that uh, fruit remains tend to be pretty scant across Iberia, uh, as shown in this chart. Um, you know, there's not every single time period represented um, in some of these regions, and um, many of these fruit remains from um, th that are recovered come from um, cesspits or different mineralized um, contexts that we just haven't come down upon uh, yet at Torre and Galmez. So um, those types of preservation conditions do tend to preserve the smaller, more fleshy parts of fruits that, uh, when they pass through the digestive tract, can be preserved uh, more readily than if they were uh, to be carbonized, or um, you know, it's not so likely that um, fruits would necessarily encounter heat or fire um, to become carbonized and preserved then. <coughs> but I think the pattern that bears out, um, and that we saw in kind of the historical overview, is that um, kind of the, the more southerly coast and um, easterly coast has much more diversity in terms of the types of fruits here, which is different than up in the north. So again, seeing this divide across the region and across cultural lines, that kind of southern Islamic Spain um, has uh, a much more rich fruit variety here, more of a um, kind of cornucopia of fruit, if you will, uh, versus more limited uh, fruits that we see in the north. So with the wild seeds, um, there are 28 identified, 15 are those kind of unknown ones that I'm still trying to work mm -hmm. on. Um, there's no evidence yet of irrigation in the weedy flora. Uh, instead, we see a really wide range of habitats, like meadows and possibly fields. Um, and so if you're you know, imagining kind of a summer landscape and want to see what maybe these kind of typical wildflowers might be, we have things like gallium, geranium, malva or mallow, um, lamium, and tons of wild grasses. Um, so if you can just you know, imagine Menorca blanketed with these purple and yellow flowers in the spring, um, that would be a nice place to live, right? So the jury's kind of out right now on being able to use um, the ecological requirements of these wild seeds to try and reconstruct um, watering practices, maybe field placements, trying to figure out what ecozones people were uh, planting their crops in. Um, so we'll have to kind of 
figure out other environmental proxies to help answer that question. Um, we have a beautiful kitchen assemblage that came from uh, Spoo 6, that beautifully preserved um, kitchen area. And so these were all refit and analyzed and described by our colleagues in Menorca, um, but we have a whole cadre of things. We have an um, al Qadafe, which is a big basin that's used either to collect or hold liquids or sometimes used as a kneading or mixing bowl. We have um, a typhors, which are wide-rimmed glazed bowls, probably used for serving. Um, and tantalizingly, there's maybe some Arabic script written in like a green glaze here on the inside. So um, I don't know if it's preserved enough to be legible. Um, but we had a few of these big like serving platter bowls, which is really typical for you know kind of Muslim and Arab style cuisine and also um, Maghrebi cuisine. We have a jar with a colander bottom that I don't know of any parallels of. Our colleagues seem to not know any parallels of, so I'd be really curious to see if anybody else has ideas about what these are used for. Um, the first thought was maybe this was a, like a cheese strainer. Um, Menorca is famous for its cheese, so maybe this was something used to you know, help um, strain away the, the liquid produced when you're um, making cheese that way. Um, How big is this? Uh, the, so the bottom of the jar is maybe about this big, and so then the jar itself is um, something like this. Yeah, yeah, maybe, what is that, 50 cent 40 centimeters tall or so, and maybe 30 centimeters at its widest point. I mean, it's a hefty piece of something. Um, <laughs> we have a lot, of, um, a lot of other jars that are beautifully decorated. Um, here's um, just a drawing to show some of the vibrant reds that would have been included here. Um, these are really fancy. They have like three or four handles. Um, what were they used for? Water, juice, vinegars, um, oils. The jury's still out. Um, we also had a ton of kind of busted, broken, heavily used cooking pots or ollas. We also found some cooking pot lids and um, a brazier, which is kind of a movable oven. So uh, kind of putting these together, you know, we have the whole cooking slew, right? Like you've got your pot, you've got the place to put it and to heat it on, um, and the, um, the lid to help it simmer so it doesn't dry out and lose all its juices. So uh, this looks like a really well-equipped kitchen. So. The other kind of line of evidence we're still um, waiting for some more uh, results from is what, it, what do the faunal remains look like? We have a lot of medium-sized mammal. The bones are generally pretty fragmented. Um, there have been some chicken bones identified as well, uh, but we have found a few bones with um, pretty clear butchering marks. So the questions are, um, you know, were these bones chopped up as people were preparing maybe cuts of meat for stew in these beautiful stewing cooking pots, um, or all these breaks uh, post depositional, right? What's the taphonomy of this assemblage? So thinking about the kinds of evidence that we have for foods and the food remains, um, I tried to look for recipes in the, cookbook, the 13th century cookbook by al Tujibi that use those ingredients. Um, since we had a bunch of barley, you know, are we having a barley buffet in Menorca? Um, barley is called Sha'ir in Arabic, and I apologize for slaughtering <laughs> Arabic and Spanish pronunciations. Um, but al Tujibi records tons and tons and tons of different types of recipes that use barley. Um, there's uh, different recipes for porridge that were used as breakfast foods and also um, as um, medicinal applications, you know, something that you would give to someone who had a fever or other kind of hot temperament features. Um, apparently they made a sun-fermented sauce um, called marinaki um, out of barley. There were hand-washing powders that um, called for um, ground barley at various grits. You know, if you kind of think about um, maybe like an exfoliating hand wash, um, there were different recipes that called for like chickpea flour and barley flour and certain types of rose water. So it's basically like a nice little um, exfoliating perfumed hand wash here. Um, there's also mention of barley being used to feed to cows to um, fatten them quickly. 
And then um, there were a lot of kind of stewed porridge recipes too that fell under the category of marmaz, um, which is which calls for coarsely crushed green barley, so it's not quite ripe. Um, this barley was called to be parched in an earthenware pan, coarsely crushed, sifted, and then stored. When you were ready to make the dish, then um, you added a broth made from beef or mutton. Um, you put butter on it, and then you spread meat pieces all over it and season it with cinnamon and ginger. So maybe a, a tasty stew like that it is something to expect from this marmouze recipe. So returning to some of our questions then, um, what aspects of farming practices and food waste can we construct? Um, we have a couple of economic staples in the botanical assemblage, barley, bitter vetch, grape, and fig, although very scant. Um, the cultivating method and kind of field placement is really unclear. Um, the evidence that we have for people for where people were growing their crops while they lived at Tottenham Galmas is really circumstantial. Um, that irrigated barranco that I showed the picture of is um, like a kilometer and a half, maybe two kilometers walk away from um, the settlement. So definitely kind of within maybe a realm of um, walkability. Uh, there's a ton of dishes for barley, so it's probable that the barley remains that we have are remnants of food. Um, and we have this beautiful large kitchen assemblage that um, is going to be really interesting to compare to the different types of remains or uh, the different types of um, cooking preparations and recipes in, in the cookbook. Uh, and as I said, funnel analysis is ongoing and um, looking forward to finding more possible recipes. So then how does the assemblage at Tordin Galmas compared to on the mainland, um, broadly speaking, it most resembles assemblages in the south and southeast. Uh, from an environmental and a cultural perspective, that makes sense. Um, but of course, we need to do a more detailed comparison with individual sites. Um, instead of looking just broadly at regions, um, it'll be important to compare um, similarly sized um, settlements with uh, that at Galmas. So next steps. Um, we're going to try to reconstruct the agricultural calendar using that calendar of Cordoba. We're going to uh, incorporate more faunal analysis and do a more systematic incorporation of botanical and ceramic remains with the text to really try and maybe suggest, uh, instead of just a barley buffet, what else were people eating here? Um, we'll do a more robust comparison of these patterns um, with sites on the mainland, and uh, we'll try to expand into a larger scale investigations of land use, including animal husbandry and natural resource acquisition, like um, timber, maybe using reeds for like wattle and daub constructions and quarries for other types of stones. So thank you very much. I'm very eager to hear anybody's ideas, thoughts, suggestions, uh, ideas for next steps. Uh, we also have an Instagram account. Um, it's at mapproject360. Um, there's a lot of fun field photographs there if you guys are interested in following. So. Thank you very much. to Valencia and Granada and Catalonia and I'm wondering um, you know obviously these are very different time periods of when they were reconquered mm -hmm. I mean with those Catalonian comparisons you're gonna start getting reconquest by Christian kingdoms before uh, this island is even conquered incorporated into um, into Islamic Al-Andalus right. um, and so I just I'm just wondering um, where are you looking for these comparative sites and um, you talked a little bit about this idea of refugees um, mm -hmm. fleeing these battles of the Reconquista to the islands. I'm wondering, do you anticipate those being from more of these earlier skirmishes, battles going on in Catalonia, or is it later on when Valencia becomes like a really big mm -hmm. uh, uh, playing, I guess, yeah. figure in the Reconquista? I just, uh, yeah, yeah I, good I, question. I would love to know more about this, um, especially because I don't know much about exactly why it took 200 years to then move out to the islands. Right, right. Like, so, um, 
first to answer your question about where are we looking for comparative sites, the literature. <laughs> um, <laughs> relying on the work that other colleagues are doing, um, and then, you know, it's a chronology game, right? Um, this is a really chronologically complex period, and so um, the categories that then you apply to these sites are um, also complicated, right? You know, if it's if you're looking at two sites that were occupied at the same time, but one was Christian, one was Muslim, um, what a lot of people have done have still compared them, but with the cultural caveat that you know we might expect different things, and so there's um, a really complex web to kind of disentangle there. But the first step would be to look at just chronologically what is contemporaneous with our 13th century uh, settlement at Sorna Ghanas. Um, your second question about what was your second question about? Um, I don't think I had them all like listed in questions. I think it was just like a bunch of thoughts that were like, "Tell me about this." Um, right. Where are the refugees? Oh, okay. Yes, from? yes. Um, that is a good question. <laughs> that is um, a topic that is, as far as I'm aware. Um, anyone else might have other ideas. Uh, I'm not so certain what published literature there is on that. There are a few um, earlier articles that kind of, um, that are more focused on tracing the arrival of um, North African groups to the islands and to Iberia, but not so much work so much on tracing the movement back downwards. Um, I don't know, David, are you familiar with any literature tracing that the movement of the Muslim populations back south? No. Yeah, um, so that's something still undergoing study for sure. Great, thanks. Alex. Um, first off, really great talk. It's exciting to see it kind of coalesce into this presentation after seeing you work on it and laugh. Um, <laughs> Sorting empty samples for hours. <laughs> um, I guess kind of in this broader, two things, in this broader context of like Mediterranean comparison, um, it's on a different time scale but I guess the place to maybe look in terms of archaeological data, literature-wise, is in Sicily and southern Italy, mm -hmm. because you similarly have that Islamic conquest and then a reconquest south by the Normans uh, in the 11th. So I'm sure you possibly already even looked into that, but just a possible another yeah, point thank comparison you. in this broader Mediterranean picture. Absolutely, more weird islands with complex histories. <laughs> Um, and then the only other question I had um, was actually in relation to those really lovely ceramics. Mm -hmm. I was curious if um, in that analysis, I know it's all kind of cursory, if there had been any sort of, if like you had figured out where are these ceramics coming from? Like, are they local? Are they importing these from mainland Iberia? Um, is there anything that this can say in terms of like, how is this community oriented? Like, is it a local orientation within the Balearic Isles, or is it very clearly oriented to in conversation in relation to mainland? Yeah, that's a really good question, and something that our team is also interested in. Um, these ceramics were literally photographed and sent to us earlier this week, so um, it's still very much undergoing analysis. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely a consideration. There's. Um, so far, the conversation to answer that question has revolved around um, forms, right? What are the shapes um, that we see in the islands versus on the mainland? And my understanding is that currently what we have look much more like um, kind of a, a local island assemblage. Um, I could be mistaken. I'm still very much learning um, the material culture of this new time and place to me. Um, so I would be curious if anybody else has other impressions uh, based on, on the forms that they see. Uh, in terms of identifying like paste and things like that, uh, I think that's in, in progress too. Bob, did you? I was just going to say that thing on the top right, in China that would be a steamer. A steamer? And it would be associated oh. with another vessel, of course, that has to hold the water underneath. Yeah, it, but, okay, interesting. Um, that would be our first guess if we found something like that. Neat. So would, uh, as a steamer, would it be uh, like elevated in some way above? Yeah, it would fit on another vessel. Oh, I see, on the rim. Usually a tripod yes. vessel where you boil your water and then your cool. vegetables or whatever go on the top. And the, yeah. you have some that are four feet tall. Oh, and then you'd have a lid on top of this. Yeah, yeah. Does this have a spout? I mean, I can tell the top is broken. But it doesn't look like it. Yeah. Um, it seems to just be, I don't know the official term, but just yeah, kind just of a, like a rim, rim yeah. slightly curved in. 
Um, we didn't find anything with spouts. Everything seems to be just a rim. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll take you this question. <laughs> <laughs> David. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, really. <laughs> um, so, interested in, thanks. It's a great talk. Um, interested in two issues um, land tenure mm -hmm. and rice. And so, first, mm -hmm. land tenure. Um, do you have any documents from this period, or is there anything you can draw on from the mainland? Just my impression on you know the, the context that you presented is, it, I mean, it, maybe it goes against the pattern of the wet north with minifundios, more equal distribution of land, and the dry south with latifundios and you know expansive more more inequality, riverine based agriculture. Um, we're here maybe either because it's more marginal landscape or because these are refugee populations. They, they seem a little more like small holders, and I don't know if you have any documentation on that. And then I was sort of was expecting to find rice because of Valencia, but then, um, but maybe, it, like, would it, is it too dry here? Or what's I the think deal so. With rice? Yeah. Um, so your first question about, um, like, documents for land tenure and things like that. There, our sense is your, your second surmise that, like, these are small landholders, they're peasants, there's not, like, they're in marginal areas, they're not super interesting to the state for whatever reason. Um, what the, like, the tax documents and registers that I'm more familiar with come from the, the more urban centers that deal with um, the land more within that kind of urban ring around it, or the rural ring around the urban center. Uh, I don't think Tordon Gown is really fits into kind of that hinterland model in the urban areas. Um, the closest city to the site is the small town of Alayor. Um, we're not really sure what that looked like in the medieval period, if it was just a small town that happened to continue to be inhabited and grow into the modern city it is, or you know, kind of what um, this landscape's relationship is with the urban centers where people were taking um, stock of those types of things. I think there's more information on Mallorca, which is you know the next island over, not necessarily directly comparable, but um, when the Catalans came in, they started to write down more things. Mm -hmm. So um, we can kind of reverse engineer maybe plots a little bit based on the way that the Catalan records record the divvying out of the newly saved land, right? Um, so that's going to be a, a next step to do um, in the process of kind of identifying what those sources are. Uh, are they translated? Do I need to learn more medieval Spanish? Like, <laughs> what are the skills needed to um, to tap into those uh, data sets? But definitely, yeah, good question. And then, second question about rice: Is your question just where is yeah, it? Yeah, where's the rice? I mean, I know the sample <laughs> is small. Maybe the preservation isn't great. But yeah, is it too dry? Or yeah. we think it might be too dry, um, and maybe a little too labor intensive if we have peasants living here. Um, but reading the historical documents that kind of give you know highlights of regions and what cities and areas are known for um, rice is really only grown in like Valencia and Murcia mm -hmm. so in the more tropical hot areas uh, you don't really see it um, talked about being grown in other places uh, I don't remember exactly how those historical descriptions compare with the botanical evidence, like where we find rice, but my understanding is it's not very well represented archaeobotanically in this region. So where is it? I, I think in all of um, Spain, Iberia, it's not well represented. So Leonardo's paper that you documented, I think there's one or two sites that have any rice in them. It just doesn't preserve well. Uh, it wasn't probably was not grown widely. I mean, if you go to India or China or something, you find rice in all the sites. So it was not grown widely um, enough to be visible in the archaeological yeah. record. But I mean, the Huerta of Valencia, like, is with this famous rice field, like yeah. irrigated yeah. rice fields. No, and but it's not that people weren't growing it, right? Like, we know people were growing it, but it's not um, being widespread enough that it's ended up in these archaeological yeah, it might be you know uh, an, more of a like economic accessibility thing, right? If it's a restricted, uh, if it's a crop that's grown in a restricted area, it's going to maybe cost more to get a hold of, and maybe the people at Galmas didn't have those economic resources to buy that imported rice, right? Um, maybe at other urban sites where there would be more people with 
economic power, we might find it there. Um, so yeah, it's definitely uh, like a socioeconomic factor for sure. And then you know when you think about the way that rice is cooked, also it's steamed and boiled, and that oftentimes doesn't lend itself very well to preservation. So um, there's kind of two uh, biases there at play to erase it out of the record or prevent it from being deposited. I should say. Becky. So um, thank you. This is really interesting, and that brazier is gorgeous. I know, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> My question is about drinking. Uh -huh. um, so you talked a fair amount about what people were eating, uh, but drank barley, <laughs> lots of barley, barley. Oh, what do you think they were drinking, and do you expect to find evidence of that when you go back to the cell? That is a good question. Um, water, if the cistern that is between those houses was used to collect water, we expect people to maybe be drinking some of that. Uh, in terms of like other juices or things like that, um, I'm not really sure. I think our best evidence would be um, in those culinary texts that describe beverages and things like that. Um, I haven't looked too deeply into beverages yet, but uh, we haven't found any drinking cups really. Uh, yeah, I noticed. Yeah, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, that begs the question like what what were they using? How is that missing piece of evidence um, preventing us from understanding the beverage aspect of, of dining too? Okay, I just that's that's interesting. I mean, I assume so. They're they're making breads mm -hmm. in like a cooking type of yeah. Oven. Okay, so yeah, where are the serving vessels? Maybe there aren't any because they're dipping it in the pot, but your pot so narrow. Yeah. But going back to your strainer jug, I like that for juice. Juice, yeah. Yeah, like in the middle of a juice making process. Okay. You could imagine, like, you would need to have increasingly smaller strainer. Uh huh. You didn't want to eat too much of the other stuff. Yeah, totally. That would be fun. Um, so, I. I'm thinking about your comment about the serving vessels. I'd have to look again at the fragments of the plates that we have, um, but we basically just have like rim fragments, which is good and bad, right? We can get a diameter from that and, and uh, get a sense of the scale of these things. Um, but there's probably like communal serving platters. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask my ignored stupid question. <laughs> so I'm thinking about the states of your comparison, both between the island and the mainland and across the Mediterranean. And I'm wondering if, so I'm wondering sort of what motivates those comparative questions, like what are you actually looking to prove or disprove or figure out. But I was also wondering if you know you, you said there's this essentially the cultural understanding of what um, a Muslim house would look like before important, but I'm wondering if in the context of the, the conquista, whether there's citational practice going on, like people are very consciously positioning themselves through either what they're eating or what they're serving it in and what the vessels look like in relation to the clear identity lines that are being drawn in, in the region at the time and how you would see that? Yeah, both really good questions. Um, so in terms of, I guess I'll work backwards because I have more thoughts about the identity aspect. So um, <coughs> that's something that we're, we're trying to tease out also, right? How do people decide to reveal or hide uh, aspects of their identity based on how they build their houses, how they eat, what they eat, when they eat? Um, I'm not really sure how to access that really through the material culture at the moment. I need to sit down with that a little bit more. If, if anyone else has ideas, I'd be happy to hear. But I am aware of a lot of um, historical documents kind of in this later period, kind of late, um, or I guess early 14th into the 15th centuries, um, where it becomes you know dangerous to eat like a Muslim. Um, and there's whole uh, compendiums uh, basically of um, court records that Neighbors are accusing other neighbors of, you know, fasting all day, and then they had a big meal after night, and I think it's Ramadan, so I'm living next to a Muslim. You need to arrest them. So there's a lot of um, those types of like, um, kind of neighbors telling on each other in court documents in subsequent centuries, um, but uh, that tends to happen more in kind of areas that had recently been reconquered. And there's such a complex question about identity, religious identity, cultural identity, and kind of what that mosaic looks like for people on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, 
this is something that I'm just starting to scratch the surface with myself, and the, the project is also. So um, it'd be interesting to maybe have you continue to ask some questions as we get more data and think a little bit more about that. Thank you. Uh, what was the first part of your question? I forget. I'm so sorry. Like, oh, yes. So, um, you know, we're trying to kind of figure out, I guess from the smallest scale, what was life like for people in this specific site? If they are a refugee population, as we think they might be, um, how, would we be able to see differences in the material culture in their food and the types of decisions they're making and how they grow their food? Um, are we able to see other patterns that might fall along cultural lines? Or are people's agricultural and cuisine decisions based more on environmental conditions? Um, are they eating barley because it grows better here? Or are they eating barley because that's their preferred food of choice because that's what they were grown up with or what they grew up with? Um, so trying to kind of parse out those different um, vectors and decision making for people. And you know, my kind of idea is to continue to scale that up from sites to regions to then Eastern and Western Islamic areas. Um, definitely a, a multi-year long kind of term project, but it's exciting to start to really build up the Western Mediterranean corpus in comparison with what I have from the Levant right now. So thank you for the questions. Wade. Um, this has been fascinating. And I know you showed me some of these things yesterday when I dropped by your office, but I have more questions. And in particular, I've seen this all together. I was wondering if you could go back to the, the slide with the, the layout of the, of the uh, features or the contexts. Uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So this is super cool. But you know, what struck me is that just given the paucity of the remains that you have, and I, I guess they're all coming from that house. This one, yeah. Yeah. So this is more a question about just kind of the nature of um, the work as it's done in Spain or, or typical practices and such. But like one of the things that struck me is that, you know, in the Southwest, it's similar sorts of like, you know, generally arid, warm kind of climate, like you don't do a lot of cooking inside during the summer. And so would, is it standard practice in Spain to like excavate the patio fully and take samples? Because it seems like you're only getting, your interior house sample is going to be biased, right. I would feel. Like you wouldn't necessarily, totally. you would only have people in like, when they're super cold and it's 60 to low of 60 degrees on the islands or something in December, people are inside huddling up around their brazier. Exactly. It feels like the rest of the time they're going to be out on the patio using yeah. spaces. And is that standard? Do you know? Like, do people actually go and will, will they excavate all that rubble, or is it will it be cleared? Could you take samples from the patio area to to actually potentially get a better sense of perhaps seasonal? activity or, or things like yeah, that? Yeah, good questions. Uh, I am not sure if it's standard practice to excavate patios. Um, maybe people who have other different experience in Spain could comment on that. But um, we did a small sondage in the middle, basically just looking for bedrock, because uh, bedrock is pretty shallow here. So we're trying to figure out, like, did they, um, what was the kind of the surface of, of the patio? Um, part of the goals for this season, as I said, is to excavate these two rooms here, um, and that also uh, will include kind of the edges of the patio and where the walls kind of meet that surface. So um, definitely will plan to collect samples from um, those areas. Um, yeah, hopefully they'll have more. <laughs> cool. Or even behind the houses. I mean, like behind yeah, SP6 true. and 9, it would look like a good place to throw out trash. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, into the old Italiotic house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All the trash. <laughs> uh, it's, I think um, we're kind of at war with excavating permits right now, so I think the back wall is our, uh, <laughs> our boundary, mm -hmm. but we'll see what we can get away with. <laughs> uh, it, not so much in terms of like permission from, you know, uh, permission to excavate, but um, there are a couple other kind of competing like Menorca Heritage excavation teams that also want to excavate this. But we're thinking they want to excavate the Taliotic house behind it, so they're excavating through this medieval component as just overburden. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to kind of salvage that and use it scientifically before, you know, the Menorcan team comes through to excavate the Circle House. Uh, did I answer all your questions? Yeah. Okay, cool, awesome. It's 1:30, so we better draw it to a close there. Thank you, everybody.